Grace and peace in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship in the expanded community of First Presbyterian Church, San Anselmo. We're glad you're here. Um, a welcome back to Natsuko. We're so glad that she's back. <laughs> After her travels, um, gosh, she, not because you started playing. I was just like, there she is. Yay. Um, so it feels like this last week in the summer, you know, summer's a time where we're coming and going and Carl's back from his travels. I was gone last week. I'm so grateful um, to Maureen and everybody who stepped in to, to handle that. But you know, in our, all our comings and goings, we get to come back into this place where again and again our paths converge so that one more time we can say as we do every day and every Sunday that this is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's worship God. And I'm going to invite Judy to come and lead us in our call to worship. Uh, as we gather in the body of Christ, please join me in the call to worship. Gracious light bearer, into the shadows of our isolation, you speak words of life and love and community. Challenger, Challenger of our, our lives, lives, you, you call, call us from places we call home to lead us more deeply into the world you love. With your gentle healing touch, you redeem the broken places of our lives and you heal the wounded places of the earth. Inspire our worship here this day so that we may share liberation in your word and be filled to overflowing to share your reconciling love throughout the earth. Come, let's worship God. Let's worship God and let's rise in body or in spirit as we sing together our opening hymn number 405, Praise God for this Holy Ground. Join me in prayer as we confess our need for God. Holy Spirit, 
you taught us to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive us the harm we do, the words we say, the times are silent when we should speak. Give us, and then with your healing touch, give us the grace and capacity to forgive others, to forgive the hurt we have experienced, the careless word, the times the world has passed us by. Give us, give us hearts as loving and generous as your own. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join me as we affirm God's ab abounding grace. Give thanks to God, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever, and you are included in that love. God is love, and the love of the risen Christ. God abides in us and we abide in God. God's love is made complete in us. Let's proclaim God's good news together. In the creating, sustaining spirit of the risen Christ, we are forgiven, loved, and, and set, set free. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Alleluia, amen, and assured of that grace, this is the time in worship where we exchange signs of peace with each other. So the first thing we'll do is we'll put, there we go, we've got, we'll wave peace in this room to our siblings in Christ online, even there as you can wave peace back to us. Um, and then if you are online in just a moment, Mary Catherine will make it so that you can unmute your microphones and exchange words of peace with each other there, just as we will do in this very room. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Peace be with you, everybody. Peace, Peace be with you. Hello. Hello. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. You look great. Peace be with you, Oprah Harris and Limbs. Be with you, man. Jack. Jack, stand on guard. <laughs> Smacking, this guy's smacking his own nuts. That was really funny. We have a lot of people here. We should all be like talking to <laughs> Good morning, Jill. Great to be with all of you. Guys, I'm not watching it today. Say good morning, Jill. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, Patty. Good morning. Good morning to all. Morning. Morning. Certainly a lovely day. Yeah. Good morning, Kat. Is this a lovely day? Is it everybody's here? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Barbara, hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Hi, Martha. Oh, today is a little bit too bad. Hi, Martha. Lynn, want me to scratch your back? Yes, please. <laughs> this is a hard to get slot. <laughs> yeah. Because it used to be a victory. So, does anybody have anything to share? What's, what's something good? It's fun, it's beautiful, right? People, loving people. I'm like, 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 I'm yeah. Good to see you. Yeah. May the peace three, three, three weeks ago, today. Hey, give me a piece. May the peace of Christ thing. be with you always. <laughs> and you said, did you have surgery? And also with you. Yes. That's the end. And also with you. Yeah, they put May it the back together. May the peace of Christ be with you always. Yeah, a partial yeah. replacement. Always. Okay. Good to see you. Whether you are a child or a child at heart, whether you're worshiping with us here in this room or with us online, um, this time is for you. Hey, Miss Ann, how are you doing? Oh, well. Good to see you. 
glad that you're back in town too. Thank you. Thank you for watching oh, this for me. Harder putting it together. That's good. You'll find out. There's a story. Kind of both. We're taking something apart and we're putting something together. Um, so uh, I want to tell a story, but before I tell a story, I want to get us grounded and just ask us a question. We're going to talk about this place in this building. So first, I just want to ask us, what are the things that we do when we meet in this room? Say peace be with you. Pray. Pretzel the pretzel prayer, very specifically. We sing. We get communion. We get communion. I love that. We gather at this table. We hear, we hear a sermon. High five on that one. <laughs> there we go. Oh, yeah, there we go. And we hear Natsuka play the organ. It's a great thing. So we lo I love gathering here with y'all. Did you notice anything different when you drove up or when you walked up today on the outside of the sanctuary? There's work going on outside the building. There is work going on outside the building. There is scaffolding all over the place. So I want to tell you a story about what happened in this place this year. So back in February, you probably can't remember it, but when it was raining, you know, so back when it rained, it hasn't rained for a long time, yes. it started. It it, did it rain yesterday? Oh, my gosh. A heavy fog. What, it rained so much, and the roof started to leak wow. right up there. It started to come down, and when we got here that Sunday morning, Natsuko found it. It was leaking back where the organ pipes are, back behind the organs. And so Natsuko and some brave members of the choir and Carl, they went and they found every trash can they could find, and they set them up back there. You may not have even seen them, but it looked crazy up there. There were all of these um, trash cans that were hitting the... Hitting the um, uh, hitting in the, in the, tra uh, the, the rain was hitting in the trash cans. So we found out that we had a leak in the roof. The roof is 65 years old, Ooh. older than me, That's old. older than me. That's and so, you know, it had a leak. So the first thing that we did, so Mr. John Cowperthwaite and some others, they, they, they patched the roof. Now they use something better than duct tape, but duct tape is the universal symbol for fixing things. So they got some roofing people to come in and they patched it, and that was just a temporary fix. But what's happening now is the roofers are there during the week and they're putting a whole new roof on this building. And last week, they took their hammers and they took off the old roof. So they took off the old roof. So I've got some pictures. Carl, can you show me the first picture? Look, oh, yeah, so that's that. it, so that's scaffolding. So you can see that's, the roof is kind of tough to get to. So the workers have to get up there on that scaffolding and they were up there working and they took the roof off on this side and that side. And we did it on a week when the preschool was closed. You know, the preschool's closed only for one week a year. And so, well, two weeks a year, but it was one of the weeks. And so we, we did that so we wouldn't disturb the preschool. So this is what it looks like. Show the next slide. So John, did you go up to Oxtaby and take this picture? Is that where this one comes from? Dave did. So Mr. Dave Jones went up to the building across the street where their apartments, and he took that. So look, the roof, the, t the shingles are all off, and that's just wood. So right now there's just wood above us, and this coming week they're going to come in and put on new shingles. So they'll be working about it. So, so we, we have the choir showing us, you can see where it was leaking. See the corner, the corner, that's the only place of the subroofing that is damaged. And then she just asked me the question. She said, so that if a donkey went up on the roof, it might fall in. I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that because the good news is, she the the subroofing that was under there was still strong still strong after 65 years. So that's pretty good. That's so they, they did not find a chicken there. No, nope, no chickens up on the roof. No, Oh, so, because evidently there was a toy chicken that at one point was thrown up on the roof and we're wondering where that is. They didn't find that, or at least they didn't tell me. So I just, so all of this, all that work, all that work, catching the water and doing a temporary fix and then hiring folks to do that. We do that 
so that we can continue to do the things that we do in this room, so that we can continue to come together with our friends and pray and sing, and we get to do this because before us, there were people who took care of this place for years and years before I ever got here in 2005, before you all ever arrived. I know. And we're doing this so that we can do it and so that years from now, years from now, the people who come after us will be able to sing and worship in this place. I think that's pretty cool. So let's do what we do and let's pray the pretzel prayer for which we have a volunteer to lead. Excellent. Okay, ready? Oh, we are going to hold hands for the pretzel prayer, huh? So that we don't run. <laughs> so we'll have one person, Shira, you hang out with me, and we will do the pretzel prayer while everybody else holds hands. Okay, we're going to improvise. Here we go. Ready? God, I love you. God, I love you. Help me to love others. Help me to love others. As you love me. As you love me. Amen. That's, that's some pretty clever improvisation there. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So um, I've, I listened to Scott Quinn's sermon from last week. Wasn't that lovely? I'm so glad that uh, my friend got to be here with you and you could hear him preach. He, um, he, he serves the Marin community and the Marin interfaith community in just such lovely ways. So this week, we're stepping back into our series, Call Your Next Witness, and remember, we're looking at courtroom scenes in Scripture. And in today's readings, we're actually going to get glimpses of two courtroom scenes. The first reading, though, brings us a glimpse of a courtroom scene from Shakespeare. So I'm not going to go into the details, but this is a courtroom scene where the plaintiff has come demanding a pound of flesh for a debt that has not been paid. And the speech that Jessica will share with us is a plea for mercy. And then the choir will sing the anthem, and in the second reading, it comes from Genesis, from Scripture, and it's from the story of Joseph and his brothers, which I'll tell um, with some detail. It's a big story uh, in the sermon. But in that story, Joseph's brothers have done him wrong in just about every possible way. They tried to kill him, and then they sold him into slavery. You can't get much worse than that. And so now we get to the point in their lives where the tables have turned, and now Joseph is the one with all of the power, and they come needing something from him. So that's the setup for the second scripture. We have this courtroom scene from Shakespeare, a courtroom scene from, uh, from Genesis, and what I invite us to do in all of this, listen, 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 for the quality of mercy. Our first reading is from The Merchant of Venice. The quality of mercy is not constrained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this scepter to sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore you, though justice be your plea, consider this that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy too.
Our second reading is Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15. As Joseph confronts the brothers who have done him wrong, then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of, ahead of you to preserve for you, for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God, he made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says, God has made me lord of all Egypt, Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children, and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will be become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother, Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded to me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother, Benjamin, and wept, and Benjamin embraced him weeping and he kissed all of his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. We celebrate the written word of, Christ, of scripture. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. We celebrate the living word, Christ among us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to be God. God. Please pray with me. Loving God, thank you for all the ways that your living world, word reconciles us to you and to each other. In the hearing of your word today, may we experience your tender mercy so that we can go and live that out in the world you love. Amen. This moment in this morning's scripture is the big reveal. Joseph's no good brothers have done him wrong in the very worst possible ways. They didn't like him, so they decided to kill him, and they left him for dead in a pit. But when some traders came riding by, they came up with a more profitable idea, and they pulled him out of the pit and sold their brother into slavery. Joseph went from that pit into slavery and eventually into prison. But now, years later, Joseph has risen to the top of Pharaoh's household. He's Pharaoh's right-hand man, the number two man in the number one empire. And Joseph's brothers, who all those years ago left him to die and then sold him, now they've come to beg. They've come to beg for food in a famine. They have no idea who he is, but here they are in Joseph's court, and they're about to find out. It's the big reveal. The jig is up. 
The chickens have come home to roost. Time to pay the piper. This is a courtroom scene, and we know what happens now. The wrongdoers are called to account, and they get what they deserve in a good courtroom scene. That's how that works. That's how the world is set right. But before we get to the big reveal, let's rewind a little bit and remember how they all got here. Joseph is one of 12 brothers, 12 brothers from several different mothers. Joseph is the favorite son of the favorite wife, and he knows it, and he's insufferable. Joseph is a dreamer. He has these dreams where somehow he always comes out elevated above his brothers, and he flaunts his privileged place wearing that coat of many colors that their dad had made for him. And on one day, the brothers have had enough. They see Joseph coming out into the fields and they decide to kill him. They attack him and throw him into a dry cistern in the desert with no water. They leave him there to die. They are super nice guys. But as the brothers are having their lunch, some traders ride by and the brothers get this better idea. They decide to sell Joseph and make some money. I mean, they say we can't really kill him because he's our own flesh and blood. Let's sell him into slavery and make some money. So they sell Joseph. They take his coat, put goat's blood on it, and go back home and tell their father that some wild animals have attacked and killed his favorite son. They break their father's heart. The traders ride away with Joseph in chains and they sell him to one of Pharaoh's officials where Joseph excels and rises up but has some bad luck and winds up in prison. While he's in prison, Joseph starts to interpret dreams for his fellow prisoners. He has a gift. One of those fellows, when he's free, remembers this and tells Pharaoh, and Pharaoh pulls Joseph out of prison to interpret some disturbing dreams that Pharaoh has been having lately. The bottom line of those dreams, Joseph tells Pharaoh, is that there will be seven years of feast. There are going to be seven years of abundant crops, followed then by seven years of famine. So Joseph advises Pharaoh to start preparing for the famine now, and Pharaoh listens. He puts Joseph in charge of all that, in charge of all Egypt, saying, only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you, Joseph. That is how Joseph comes to be the number two man in the number one empire. For seven years of feast, Egypt stores away its grain so that it will be ready for what is to come. And then, just as Joseph said, famine hits hard. Meanwhile, back in Canaan in this famine, Joseph's brothers and his family are starving. So they convince their father to let them take silver to Pharaoh and try to buy some of Egypt's stored up grain. Eventually, Joseph, Jacob agrees but insists that one brother, Benjamin, must stay behind. Now, Benjamin, Benjamin's the youngest. He wasn't involved in that whole killing and selling G, uh, Joseph into slavery thing. Joseph and Benjamin have the same mother, the favorite wife, and so now Benjamin has become Jacob's favorite. So the ten brothers, the ten brothers go to Egypt and beg for food from Pharaoh's top official, whom they don't know to be their brother Joseph, whom they tried to kill, whom they sold into slavery. What a mess! Now at first, Joseph tries to test them. He insists that one of them remain in prison while the others go back home and fetch Benjamin. He sends them back to their father with bags full of grain to keep them from starving and with their silver with the task of bringing Benjamin back. But their father says no until they run out of all that grain and then they persuade Jacob to let them take Benjamin. One of the brothers offers his own family as surety should they not bring Benjamin back and off they go back to Egypt. Joseph receives them. He meets Benjamin. Joseph is so overcome that he leaves the room and weeps and wails, and then he washes his face and comes back in. I love that. I love that image. He's been weeping, and he washes his face so that he looks okay when he comes back in. 
And he tests the brothers one more time. He sends them back this time to fetch their father with more bags of grain. But this time Joseph has his servants put a silver cup in Benjamin's sack. And Benjamin is then accused of stealing it. And Joseph tells his brothers, all of you can go back home except Benjamin, the alleged thief. He must stay here. And his brothers wail, no, we can't go back to our father without Benjamin. It will kill him. We can't break our father's heart again. And one of the brothers offers to stay in Benjamin's place, offers his life for Benjamin's. And that's where this morning's scripture picks up. After all that, after trying to kill Joseph, after selling Joseph into slavery, after all the miles this family has traveled since then, here the brothers stand before Joseph about to find out who he is. And Joseph commands all his attendants, leave me. It's just Joseph and his brothers who have got to be trembling and Joseph breaks out into this uncontrollable weeping so loudly that his weeping and wailing are heard throughout Pharaoh's house. This man who holds their lives in his hand, has, he's coming unhinged. Now this is a courtroom scene, remember. So we know that what comes next is a charge, a response, and testimony. When he is worn out from weeping, Joseph draws a deep breath and says only this, I am Joseph. That's the charge. That's all he needs to say. Those three words, two words in Hebrew, bring their whole life into the room and there it is laid bare. They all know. Joseph's brothers tried to kill him. They left him in a pit in the desert to die an excruciating death. But then they saw a business opportunity and sold him into slavery. The brothers are there in this room with Joseph, ostensibly charged with stealing a silver cup. But then Pharaoh's highest official says, I am Joseph, and their whole life is before them. They know what they've done. That's the charge. And then, and then their response is terrified, stunned silence. I mean, what really is there to say? And in that silence, just in case his brothers missed it, Joseph says it again and adding just a bit more, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. That's it. Charge, response, and testimony. We know what comes next after the charge is made and the issues join. There has to be a verdict. Here the evidence is not in dispute. Their murderous, enslaving ways must now be checked. This is where they get what they deserve. And look what Joseph does. Joseph calls them brother. He invokes and names their familiar relationship. I am your brother. You are mine. Joseph weeps all over this story again and again. Remember, Joseph had to leave the room when he met Benjamin. He was so overcome. And in this moment, when it's just Joseph and his brothers, he weeps so loud that he shakes the palace now, we could try to put words to emotionally what's going on with Joseph, what he's feeling. That's hard to do when you're reading Hebrew Scripture. So let's just say this. Whatever the complexity of emotion he may be experiencing, something is breaking open in Joseph. All that life he has lived up till now, all he has carried, all the life they have lived as a family, it can't be contained. It is too big for a body to hold. And Joseph weeps and wails. And in the utter quiet that follows that, Joseph says to his brothers, draw near. Now they might think 
he's wanting them to draw near so that he can do them some harm. That would be a reasonable fear. Joseph is the one with all the power here, and now in this moment, revenge is finally within his grasp. But Joseph says, draw near, see for yourself, I am your brother Joseph. Draw, Joseph draws them near so that they can see each other. I am your brother Joseph. Joseph says to them, fear not. Don't fear what you have done because here is what God has been doing. Throughout the story, they and we, we've been focused on what the brothers have done, attempted war, murder, human traf trafficking, sibling rivalry, run amok. But while they've been doing all that, Joseph says, while you were doing all that, God brought me ahead of you into this moment so that in the midst of famine, a people would not starve, so that in our world of scarcity, there would be abundance. Joseph tells them they can let go of their fear and their regret. By now it's clear that he's not going to kill them. Instead, he pours out abundance on them. I will provide for you here. Go and fetch our father and bring him here in this family. We will live together again. And they embrace. The verdict here is mercy, abundant, unconstrained, overflowing mercy. As that little bit of Shakespeare grows, the quality of mercy is not constrained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. Instead of exacting his vengeance, Joseph pulls his brothers into an embrace and they weep together the gentle rain of mercy. The quality of mercy is mightiest in the mightiest. Joseph is the one here with all the power, the power over life and death, where years ago his brothers chose death for him. Now Joseph chooses life for all of them. The quality of mercy is twice blessed. It blesseth the one that gives and the one that receives. This mercy, it is a very attribute of God, and earthly power doth show itself most like God when mercy seasons justice. The verdict here is mercy. Now, whatever happened to that saying, you get what you deserve. Isn't that the way the world works? There are some who would look at this story and say that the good news of mercy is that we don't ultimately get what we deserve. Have you ever heard that? I have. I may have said it at some point. Well, that may move us halfway toward the truth. But I don't think that's what this story is saying. I think this story is saying even more. The problem with that saying, mercy means we ultimately don't get what we deserve, is that it assumes that what we deserve is punishment. It assumes that we are always being assessed and evaluated by what we have done. Inevitably, we've done wrong, we've done something wrong, and we deserve punishment. And then mercy comes along. Joseph. Joseph is doing something radically different from that, something so much bigger even than that with his mercy. Joseph is recalibrating entirely our understanding of what it is that we deserve. Joseph's brothers stand before him with all that they've done. They all know, they all see, but somehow Joseph doesn't respond to them according to their transgression. Joseph looks out on his brothers who have done him wrong, and what he sees are people who are starving in a famine and who will die if he does not act. He looks out at his brothers, and what he sees is their humanity. If our starting place is our shared humanity, here is what we deserve. Love. Life. 
dignity, food, water, access to health care, the freedom to live without constant fear of imminent violence, all the things we need to live and thrive, providing all that, Joseph says, that's what God has been doing all along. That is what God is about in this moment, face to face with his brothers. That's what Joseph sees and does. The verdict is mercy, and that mercy and their shared humanity become the operating reality of their lives. That mercy brings with it not only a hope for a new beginning, but also a new indictment, a new indictment of all the systems that treat us, any of us, as less than fully human. Can you imagine, can you imagine what could happen if we brought that into the most strife-torn places of our world and of our lives and made mercy and shared humanity the operating reality of our lives in Gaza? to begin with the proposition that this is what the people of Gaza deserve, love, life, dignity, food, water, access to health care, the freedom to live without constant fear of imminent violence, all the things humankind needs to live and to thrive. That is what the people of Gaza deserve and the communities attacked on October 7th and the families longing for the release of hostages as governments and para-governments rage. This This is what the human family caught up in the midst of our striving deserves. Love, life, food, water, access to health care, the freedom to live without constant fear of imminent violence, all the things humankind needs to live and to thrive. What if we started there? How might our policy and our practice change big and small? What would it look like if we brought that into the nooks and crannies of our lives, the cramped spaces where we are tied up with our own discord and disagreement and grudges? What if we started every interaction with every person seeing them, seeing each other, fully human? We've been saying that these courtroom scenes bring real life into focus. This one asks us to give the kaleidoscope a twist and watch as a new and beautiful reality clicks into place. It's what God has been doing all along, and even so it is for us a new beginning. Mercy and our shared humanity now the operating reality of our lives. In this courtroom scene, Maybe that's the big reveal. And friends, one of the great blessings of our lives as we see each other as fully human and live life together in community is that we get to pray together. And so we're gonna begin our prayer with a song. It's a lovely song. Uh, There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I invite you to sing this hymn as we always do, singing it to God, but also mindful of the sweet, sweet spirits who are sitting right next to you, right with us, uh, wherever you are. Let's be in prayer.
Loving God, you created all that is, and you accompany your creation down through the ages, through the whole of life. You set the planets in motion, and you sustain life here on earth. The world is full of your abundance, and for all your creation, you desire well-being and life. Joining in your loving will for the world, we pray for the healing of creation, and we pray for every person, love, life, dignity, food, water, access to health care, the freedom to live without constant fear of imminent violence, all the things humankind needs to live and to thrive. We pray for peace with justice in Gaza, for an immediate and permanent ceasefire, for an end to indiscriminate violence and collective punishment, for the release of hostages. We pray for peace with justice there and everywhere there is violence and war. We pray for an end to systems that oppress, particularly American systemic racism, help us dismantle what must come to an end so that we can build a world where all can thrive. We pray healing for the damage we have done to the planet, for wisdom to live more lovingly and more sustainably in this age of climate unraveling. As we pray for the world, we pray for the needs of those who inhabit this world. For those who are unhoused, we pray for shelter. For those who are hungry, food enough and more. For those who grieve, comfort. For those who are ailing in body or spirit, healing. For those who are lonely, companionship. For all the broken relationships of our lives, reconciliation. For every person, love, life, dignity, food, water, access to health care, the freedom to live without constant fear of imminent violence, all the things, all the things humankind needs to live and to thrive. Drawn together in our shared humanity, we join our voices with all those who have ever called on you praying the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, again, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Um, we're a special welcome to anyone for whom it's your first time or one of your first times visiting with us. Uh, we hope we have the chance to get to know you a little better if you're here in person with us. After worship, we have coffee just across the courtyard, and we'd love to have you join us there. If you're online, we'd love to get to know you as well. You can just leave your email address in the chat, um, or you can go ahead and just email me at scottclark at togetherweserve.org. But we would, we're glad that you're here. We'd love to get to know you. We hope that as you're visiting here with us that you experience a community of, um, of multiple spiritualities so that you know that wherever you are on your spiritual journey, there is a place for you here. Uh, we have a lot going on this week. In a second, I'll get to our regular things, but we have the construction going on. So um, we have not only the roof construction that we talked a little bit about, but also we have road construction that started on Friday. So if you come to the offices, our offices will be open. If you come to the offices during the week, just uh, be prepared that parking may be a little different from what you're used to, and it may take a little longer to, to get there. You may have to come a different way. Um, so anyway, we've got the road construction. The ro work on the roof is going really well. And as you know, um, we're in the midst of a raise the roof appeal um, to help uh, gather part of the funding for that roof. And Robin is going to come and share a word about the raise the roof efforts. Good morning. I'm here to uh, talk about the Raise the Roof Appeal from where I sit, which is generally up there on the chancel. And um, the, the coral roof just couldn't withstand the ravages of these atmospheric rivers that we had last winter. Um, we'd come in every week 
Um, the buckets would have to be rearranged a little bit. We'd have to go get salad bowls from the kitchen, you know, just to stop the, the leakage above our chairs and kind of adjust the, you know, where we were sitting. Um, but what you didn't see is the damage to the organ, the Schoenberg organ that happens behind the screen. It's kind of like the Wizard of Oz. You wouldn't believe what's behind that screen back there. There's hundreds of pipes that operate this Schoenstein organ right here. So um, I'd come in um, and Natsuko's back there and she's asking for more towels and rolls of paper towels and you know she's sopping up the water because there's vents uh, on that above that chamber thing that just can't that weren't designed to withstand climate change apparently so um, uh, that we did some temporary fixes uh, we diverted the water a little bit um, and dried out the expression box. I don't even know what the expression box is, but um, it's important and um, it affected the uh, note actions, um, but that was just, it's not permanent work. So in addition to fixing our roof, we have to close off some vents that are above the organ chamber and that's a estimated to cost about $4,000 of our $65,000 appeal. So um, Natsuko is offered to give us a little tour back there if you want to find out what that expression box really is. You know, she's, she's been working her magic to, um, to, um, to compensate or cover for the damages to the note actions. Um, we want her to be able to play fully and beautifully as she always does. So I've given a little bit to this campaign um, and to protect our investments in, um, in, in the beautiful music that we're able to bring to this choir and I hope you'll be able to give some too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. I just checked with my boss, John Copperthwaite, <laughs> to get permission to share where we are on the campaign. So you know the total cost is going to be about $115,000. Um, the leadership team has decided to try and raise $65,000 of that. And in two and a half weeks, we're already over $40,000. So thank you, everyone, for your generosity. And we, we, we look good and are hopeful at making our goal. Um, and we'll continue to do all the things that we do in this space. Um, this week we have our regular prayer groups that are gathering, uh, some of them in person, some of them online. The book group will gather online on Monday. The, uh, the exercise group will be in Duncan Hall on Monday and Thursday. In addition to our gatherings for prayer and community, we also share in our justice work. And one of the main things up this, this week is on Wednesday at 5.30. Raquel, do I have it right? We're gonna gather here the anti-racism movement Book Club is reading a fantastic book called James. It's, it, I don't want to say it's an easy read. It's a fascinating read. You could buy it now and have it read by Wednesday. It is, it's called James, but it's a retelling of Huckleberry Finn from Jim's perspective. I can't wait for Wednesday. So feel free to come and join us. Could folks come if they haven't read the book? Of course, of course, all are welcome, all are welcome. And in addition to the, our justice work um, and the ways that we gather for prayer and community, we also share our resources. So in just a moment, we'll, get, we'll take up a collection here, remembering not only our regular giving and our pledges, but also the sensibility offering to go to help people in, uh, who have uh, food scarcity and hunger issues, and then deacons offering also to help those in need. And it's also an opportunity where you can give to the Raise the Roof Appeal, um, you can also do all of that online if, if that's the way that you prefer, prefer to give. This is an amazingly generous congregation. We gather our resources together knowing that we can do more together than we can ever do alone. And as we do that, as we take up the offering, we also pause at the very same time to offer prayers of thanksgiving because we know that we have so much for which 
to be grateful for. So in this time, as we welcome back Natsuko's offertory and enjoy the music that we have missed, um, Natsuko whom we have missed, I just invite you to think of one or two or three things for which you are grateful and offer up a prayer of thanks. We'll now receive our morning offering. Let's rise in body or in spirit as we sing our closing hymn number 435, There is a Wideness, Wideness in God's Mercy.
before the love of God is broader than the limits of our minds. Wow, let's go now and live out the love and mercy of our God, making as a first thing um, our shared humanity. Mercy and our shared humanity as the operational reality for our lives. Let's go do that knowing that we go Christ above us, Christ below us, Christ behind us, Christ before us, Christ beside us, and all around us, Christ within us, go in peace.